In January 2020, the President of France, Emmanuel Macron, convened a summit of the G5 Sahel Alliance. That's five French African allies in the Sahel region of Africa, made up of Mauritania, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, and Chad. He convened this in the small French city of Pau. The purpose of this summit was to discuss the war, French-led war on terror, combating the rise of Islamist groups in the region. Now already, by this stage, you might be wondering why are African leaders flying thousands of miles to sit in a, a city in the Pyrenees and listen to Emmanuel Macron, of all people, tell them how to defend their countries? The short answer, and I guess the summary of this lead-off, is imperialism. Every single one of these five members of the alliance are, is a former colony of France. Now at this summit, the reason I wanted to begin with this little fact is because at this summit, Emmanuel Macron, who has a, a wonderful habit for grand phrases, declared that they were gonna intensify the French military operation in the Sahel called Operation Bacani. And that this would provide, in his words, spectacular results. And I have to say that his prediction was much more correct than he ever could have imagined. <laughs> Today, the three most important countries in the frontier of this conflict, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, those three countries have experienced five coups. The French forces and French ambassadors have been kicked out of all three countries now. And all three are beginning a turn towards Russia. Um, the balance of forces has been completely overturned in this region. But how and why has this dramatic reversal taken place? What is the nature of these new regimes? And what does it mean for the future of the Sahel and for the African continent as a whole? And so the first point that I want to make is the role of imperialism, the nature and the role of imperialism, specifically in relation to West Africa, although of course there's a general point to be made here. And that point is that it's important to recognize that this entire region has been dramatically held back and held down by imperialism in every sense for decades. In fact, for more than a century in many cases. France and Britain alone colonized 95% of the African co uh, continent. Um, by, by account that I tried to do in my research, France colonized 29 African countries, if you include countries like Madagascar and, and islands in the Indian Ocean like Mauritius. That could be wrong, it could be more than that. And Unfortunately, the colonization of Africa deserves its own talk. I don't have time to do that. But the one point I want to bring out from this is when the European powers colonized these countries, often they destroyed what already existed without replacing it with very much. Niger and Mali were left by the French as effectively just a military outpost near the, Sahel, uh, the Sahara with very next to no economic development whatsoever. But I'm going to skip ahead to the year 1960. And the reason I want to skip so far ahead is because that's when Charles de Gaulle, president of France at that time, announced the independence of 14 African countries. Why did he do this? P um, comrades here who are familiar with French history would know that Charles de Gaulle came to power in a coup essentially in 1958. That coup was started by French officers in Algeria who were fighting the bloody Al Algerian war in order to prevent Algerian independence. And yet two years later, this um, protector of French imperialism unilaterally declares it, uh, independence for 14 countries. Why is that? Well, the explanation is in the huge push uh, for independence and waves of revolutions that took place in the post-war period. France, French imperialism itself had first of all suffered a humiliating defeat in what is now Vietnam and was bogged down in the uh, colonial war against the Algerian people to, to crush the Algerian resistance. And many um, French capitalists with interests in Africa became very, very worried that if revolution would spread to the rest of their African colonies, that their businesses, their interests would be destroyed in the course of the revolution and they might lose everything. The importance of Africa to France cannot, or French imperialism I should say, cannot be overstated. In 1947, I mean incidentally, I don't really have time to go into this, but Africa is what saved so-called free France during the Second World War. France was taken over by the Nazis and the Vichy regime and so de Gaulle and the, the free French actually based themselves in Africa, which by my count is neither French nor free at this time. But in 1947, after they'd won the war, de Gaulle recognized that for us in the world as it is and it, as it will be, to lose Francophone Africa would be a reduction that could cost us even our independence. To guard it, to make it live, is to stay great and as a consequence to stay free. What he was referring to is the rise of the Soviet Union and the USA as the, the two major world powers 
French imperialism didn't feel, feel like it had the strength on its own to compete with that, and so it pushed on the one hand towards European integration. The Schumann Declaration takes place in the same year. Again, don't have time to go into that. And a push to the south to retain its African colonies. But the most sensible and far-sighted wing of the French ruling class, including socialists like Francois Mitterrand, drew the conclusion they could not possibly hold on to these colonies by force. If they tried to do in the rest of Africa what they did in Algeria, they would simply suffer humiliating defeat and those former colonies would enter into the American or Soviet sphere of influence. What they put forward was a plan to grant formal independence to these colonies without losing any of the substantive content of colonial oppression. Hold on to the resources, hold on to absolute control, whilst also gaining a diplomatic block they could rest on in things like the United Nations. And so this is why de Gaulle, the representative of French imperialism, suddenly becomes the liberator of, uh, of the African colonies. But when the, the sting in the tail was when they agreed this formal independence, they forced or they used many ways to induce the leaders of these countries to sign up to what they referred to as cooperation agreements. Independence was to go hand in hand with cooperation. The imperialists explained that in the modern world, a single nation, African or otherwise, can't survive. Otherwise, they'll be swallowed up by the greater powers. That's why we all need to stick together as a nice family, a community, they called it, um, in order to protect and develop each other. And so this is the form the development took. First of all, upon independence, the whole of Africa was balkanized by the European powers, including France, not only France, West Africa was carved up into a number of arbitrary, artificial, weak states. To give you an example, Burkina Faso has 60 ethnic groups in it. The main ethnic group, the Mossi, is actually less than half of the population. Many of these ethnic groups actually straddle a number of national boundaries and cross over these boundaries, irrespective of the wish of the state. Um, and at the same time, Burkina Faso has always been very closely linked economically with the Ivory Coast. When they were all just one big French colony, Burkina Faso was treated effectively as a cheap labor reserve for plantations in the Ivory Coast, which because of its coastal position, it was more commercially viable. All of a sudden upon independence, that's cut off. So the, Burk the Burkinabi economy, which had been left almost entirely undeveloped, is all of a sudden supposed to maintain its own state apparatus which is, is a finished recipe for indebtedness and independence. That was the point, by the way, that wasn't an accident. Cameroon has 200 different languages in it. These are not natural borders as we, you know, the, the imperialists in Europe would talk about. Just to give you one more example, Niger and Nigeria got a different name, very similar, sound very on, on, oddly very similar. The Hausa um, ethnic group is the biggest ethnic group in Nigeria, uh, Niger. It's also the biggest ethnic group in Northern Nigeria. They consider themselves the same people, same language. Um, they have a different official uh, language and a straight line border. Why? Because they happen to be dominated by France and, and Britain in the past. The entire co uh, continent has been carved up like that in, a, in order to uh, make it weak in independence. And then the French insisted that these states that didn't even exist until the night before were to, dip, uh, were to negotiate with France on an individual basis. They were not to negotiate collectively on bloc. The content of these cooperation agreements was follows. First of all, economic co cooperation, of course, for the stability and uh, development of the Africans, of course. That was what they said anyway. The first was they were all going to have a common currency, which as we know from the euro is an incredibly progressive and uh, an egalitarian measure. The purpose of this, uh, and actually the content of it is quite similar. The, first of all, the pillars of this common currency was that the CFA franc, the CFA franc was created in colonial times. It was created in the 1940s. It stood for Colonie Africain, uh, no, Colonie Francaise d'Afrique. They kept the initials and just changed it to Communauté Financière d'Afrique. <laughs> so they basically did a quick, no, they didn't even change the initials, just changed the name. And all of a sudden they have this common uh, currency, which is pegged at a two to one ratio to France. The, the, the ratio was determined unilaterally by the French treasury and the French state. Um, that was a fixed proportion. Free movement of capital between France and its former colonies was guaranteed. Again, I would ask the question, who had all the capital in that arrangement? That effectively meant that French capital could go in and it could extract the profits with no capital controls whatsoever. It also meant that it had a guarantee of reserves. So the two central banks that were set up in Africa, one in West Africa, one in Central Africa, they had a guarantee from the French treasury that if they ever run out, uh, ran out of uh, CFA francs, they would be immediately transferred by the French treasury. That's very kind, except in return, they had to deposit all of their foreign exchange reserves in an account controlled by the French treasury. So the French state controlled the money supply of 14 different African countries. Later, that was reduced to half of their foreign exchange. Um, and only recently, I think in 2021, Macron and the French parliament announced that they didn't have to deposit any of their foreign currency exchange. And they were also going to change the name to the ECO, coming from ECOWAS, the, uh, the regional bloc. However, the, the unilaterally 
determined ratio and the free movement of capital was to remain. The impact on this, as you can imagine, has massively held back economic development, even on a capitalist basis, in, uh, in, in the region concerned. First of all, the CFA franc was overvalued related to the franc. What that means is imports from France were relatively cheap, whereas exports from the CFA franc countries, not only to France, but to other African countries that don't have the same currency, were too expensive. So it meant that indigenous industries could not compete with France or even their African neighbors like Nigeria, for instance. Uh, it meant the domestic industry was completely um, abandoned, really. It also meant that they didn't have a control over their money supply. They couldn't print money. Um, and they couldn't devalue their currency to become more competitive because the rate was fixed. So similar to what we saw in Greece under the euro, they had to carry out a process of what's called internal de devaluation. Um, that means cutting wages, austerity, in order to try and maintain uh, competitivity. Uh, the last kind of kick in the face is in 1994, France unilaterally devalued the CFA franc by half. And so overnight, all of the goods that were imported into these countries doubled in price, including staples like rice and so on. And the cost of borrowing, which was in Fran uh, CFA francs, also increased literally overnight. This has led to a situation in which uh, these parceled up, weak economies, all maintaining their own state apparatus with no economic independence whatsoever, went into a cycle of indebtedness. The only way that they could cover their bu budget deficits from year on year is to borrow, particularly from French banks at interest. And the only way that they could raise money for things like infrastructure or internal development was again by borrowing money at interest. Um, along with this came the extremely generous development aid. A development aid which is completely linked to French finance capital and often came with strings attached. For instance, if you received a loan, first you'd have to pay it back, but also one of the conditions of the loan is that you have to use it to buy French goods or contract with French companies. Um, in other words, the French benefited, the French imperialists benefited twice. They benefited from getting the interest on the loan and from the extra profits from getting these contracts. In addition, the um, African states signed um, uh, uh, treaties giving France the right of first refusal over their um, natural resources. So for instance, in Niger, Niger is one of the biggest uranium sources on the planet. It's the source of 30% of France's um, nuclear power. You know, the power stations, 30% uh, rely on um, uranium from Niger, and 100% of its military uranium that keeps it a nuclear-armed imperialist power comes from Niger. Niger has to see, uh, give France right of first refusal. The only currently operating uh, uranium mine in Niger is operated by a French um, monopoly called Orano, which is majority owned by the French state. As you can imagine, the, uh, the environmental impact on neighboring cities is immense. Higher rates of people dying from cancer. Workers who leave the mines usually tend to die in about two years. No compensation, no insurance, no health and safety put in because there is not a state strong enough to enforce it. In reality, it's up to the French state whether Orano carries out reforms or not. Um, and you might be asking the question, well, how is this position of absolute dependence and outright naked exploitation, how, does that, how has that gone on for so many decades? Don't these now independent states just legislate differently? One small reason is they have signed treaties um, um, with what's called stability clauses, meaning that if they, if they legislate against the interests of, say, Orano, in uh, Niger, then they can be sued by the company because it's disrupted the stability of its operations. Um, it, some academics estimate that Niger takes only about 12% of the marketable value of its own uranium. But anyway, you might be wondering, how, how has this come to pass? And the key, the cornerstone of all of this is the maintenance of political dependence. And the way they've done this is in a process that in, within France is known as la France Afrique, which is an extremely shady regime of client states. First of all, during the colonial period, a small um, colonial bourgeoisie, so um, plantation owners, uh, indigenous plantation owners, for instance, like Félix Oufoué in the Ivory Coast, were incorporated into the French um, political system. He was actually elected a minister of the French government. In other words, a, a, a domestic ruling class was effectively groomed by the French imperialists to put them in power on independence. If any of the domestic leaders they thought were a bit shaky, they simply replaced them. In 1958, the leaders of Cameroon and Niger were just replaced by France. This was still under colonial control so that the new leaders would be more amenable to the cooperation treaties. They duly signed the cooperation treaties, and this wonderful family, Macron says, between France and Africa, it must be a love story. This abusive relationship, this toxic relationship, is maintained by good old-fashioned straightforward corruption, you know, suitcases full of cash, holidays on the Côte d'Azur, mansions in the United States, and so on. But in addition to that, um, military support. Military cooperation treaties mean that France basically has a free hand in the whole region, not only to maintain order, internal order, 
which means basically intervening to depose a, an unfriendly government, but also to protect its, na its national security interests, which include oil, gas, and uranium, and to maintain permanent military bases. But in addition to that, um, not only the French military, but French mercenaries, people who fought in the Algerian war and then started basically plying their trade across the whole African continent. At one point, we talk about Wagner now, but not that long ago, only like 10, 20 years ago, the French were actually the biggest mercenary force in Africa. And what they would do is they would hire out their services to local dictators to maintain them in power. This was all done in the name of stability. And this is a key word when we talk about imperialism. The whole, per what is imperialism? Imperialism is capitalist monopolies linked to finance capital, the domination of the banks, which themselves extend their tentacles into the bourgeois state itself. Why? To maintain guaranteed super profits and stability for the individual capitalist state. Um, interestingly, Trotsky pointed out, I think in 1905, that imperialism, by putting out these small forest fires, by maintaining stability, actually prepares the way for an even greater conflagration. And that's what we're seeing now. Um, but this, this stability of local regimes amounted to basically maintaining people in power for decades. Um, Omar Bongo, who is the father of Ali Bongo, who was recently deposed in Gabon, ruled the country from 1967 until his death in 2009, if I remember correctly. He was a major ally of La France Afrique. Likewise, Félix Afoué in the Ivory Coast ruled from independence in 1960 until his death in the early 90s. And whenever there was a threat of a coup or revolution against these people, often the French military would intervene directly in order to keep them in power. They did this in Chad since the 1980s. The France, uh, France has been fighting on behalf of the Chad dictatorship. Um, and even in the Central African Republic, which now is, has fallen under Russian influence, actually as early as 2013, the French army intervened in order to support the incumbent president in the civil war. That's the kind of protectorate side of this. But what if a leader who is not amenable to French interests happens to come to power. Of course, they try to prevent that as much as possible, but what happens if they do? A great example of that is Thomas Sankara in Burkina Faso, which at, th at that point was called the Upper Volta. Thomas Sankara um, was an anti-imperialist leader who nationalized, went all the way in the direction of socialism, nationalized uh, great parts of the economy and industry. He cut the wages of civil servants by, in half in order to undermine corruption. He renamed the country to Burkina Faso, which means the land of the upright people. And what's more, in terms of the African continent as a whole, he put forward a bold anti-imperialist message, hinging in particular on the CFA franc, but non-payment of the debt. In um, the summer of 1987, he appeared at an all-African summit and appealed to African leaders to join Burkina Faso in refusing to pay the debt that had been taken from the imperialists. He said, prophetically, that if Burkina Faso stands alone in refusing to pay, I will not be here for the next conference. He was not there for the next conference because in October 1917, he was assassinated by his second hand, uh, second hand, right hand man, Blaise Compaoré, supported by French imperialism. Blaise Compaoré then ruled until 2014 when he was deposed in a revolution. So if you tow the line, you'll get support, you'll get development aid, which goes straight to the state and is then distributed. This, uh, this is a big part of the source of the corruption which is endemic in so-called African democracy. And of course, when liberals like The Economist write, oh, the problem is they're so corrupt, they, their economies don't develop because the state keeps on being so corrupt and the, the legal system doesn't work and politicians just pocket the cash. If only, if only they weren't so backward, if only, if only Africans weren't so inherently corrupt and tribal, then they would actually know how to spend their money. What we can see from this is the source of corruption in Africa is entirely foreign imperialism, who deliberately set up a network of corruption in which development aid is probably the central pillar, um, which basically cuts across the development of an indigenous capitalist class. The capitalist class in Mali, for instance, um, is basically just the managers that French companies put on their boards and the state. The government. Many companies are actually state-owned in, in Mali, which shows that state ownership does not equate to socialism. The reason that so many co uh, companies in, in capitalist Africa are state-owned is because the individual capitalists have so little capital and are so, are so unable to compete that they have to basically use the state as a collective capitalist in order to um, uh, absorb aid and, uh, and extract a profit. And much of this corruption is effectively profit <laughs> extraction through the looting of the state, because that's the only way that the developing or non-developing capitalist class can actually gain any profit at all. Just to give you a concrete example, to paint you a picture, in Mali, a German liberal pro-capitalist uh, research institute called the Bertis, Bertelmann Stiftung Index, apparently, apologies for my German, whose purpose is to, uh, is to trace how countries are doing in terms of market democracy, market economy and democracy, not a Marxist organization. It found that there, in Mali, there were 4,000 civil servants who never turn up to work, but still draw a salary. 
In Burkina Faso, the only people who have access to state healthcare are civil servants. In other words, and, and French companies will often put minority positions on boards to local individuals. Again, it's all you know, it's sharing the wealth, isn't it? Or they will, will they will pay a share of their profits to the Niger government, for instance, in relation to uranium mining. This, of course, is all going into the pockets of their cronies, who, if they don't follow the line, will simply be replaced by everyone else. So there is an objective need to, for, first of all, there is an objective limit suppressing any internal capitalist development in these countries, an absolute dependency on foreign imperialism, but also a constant machinery whirring away to make sure that in, an independent capitalist class does not exist. And the next political point I want to make, or theoretical point I want to make this about this, um, actually, there's one thing I want to finish on that, I talked about imperialism and how imperialism works. Another thing to point out is this policy, this is, a, an, a, this is an explicit policy that's been carried out by every single French government since 1960. That includes the socialist governments of Mitterrand, of Hollande, and the kind of, you know, La France en Marche government of, uh, of Emmanuel Macron. Sarkozy, Chirac, they've all carried out the exact same policy in exactly the same ma manner, but the socialists do it with an added gloss of hypocrisy. That's all that you get. Um, why is that? That comes to the nature of the state. The state, is, is not some independent arbiter. It's not something that with goodwill we could, oh, let's just have a non-corrupt state. Or let's have a non-imperialist state. Imperialism is not simply a policy. Imperialism is an entire period of capitalist development that stems from the objective development of capitalist, uh, capitalism itself. A state resting on bourgeois relations, on capitalism, will either defend the interests of its capitalism and its capitalist class, or it will fall, either because some stronger capitalist will dominate it, or because it will be overthrown by its own capitalist class. If that capitalist nation is imperialist and dominated by the monopolies and the banks, then that state will carry out the interest, will basically be a handmaiden of the monopolies and the banks. And France is a textbook example of this, as is Britain, of course. Now, another thing I want to say about the nature of the state is, what is bourgeois democracy? We know as Marxists that democracy is, again, not some you know, moral idea or pure form of if every, or simply just everybody gets to vote. There are plenty of elections in, in Africa. There are plenty of elections in Mali before the coup. They didn't matter. They didn't make a difference. Multi-party system. There are over 200 political parties in Mali. The problem is they have absolutely no social weight and social base whatsoever. Usually they're individuals who get state funding to run a party and then pay activists in order to, um, to, to buy votes and so on. But if if the ruling party doesn't like the result of the elections, they can always, of course, just stuff it full of fake votes, pay people to vote. Um, I'll give you an example from Mali later on. How do you have bourgeois democracy? How has bourgeois democracy evolved over time? Bourgeois democracy in countries like Britain is a great example of this, evolved along with the development of the bourgeoisie itself. The stronger the bourgeoisie itself, the more it became, the more it pushed for democratic reforms against the old feudal order and also established what we know as the rule of law, the almighty rule of law that apparently only the West has. Why is it there's no rule in, of law in countries like Mali and Niger? One part of it is actually there isn't a legal system in most of the countryside. Again, the BTI index said that the legal system basically only extends outside uh, up to the limits of the capital, Niamey. In Burkina Faso, only really the roads between the capital and the Ivorian border are sufficiently maintained. There isn't actually the infrastructure or the personnel to, carry, to have a functioning legal system in much of the countryside. But even within the capital, the judges are appointed by the state and the, the entire legal system basically func functions as an extension of the executive. Why is that? Again, oh, it's just because of corruption or it's because of tribalism or some you know, racist nonsense. The reason is you cannot have viable bourgeois political parties who push the interests of one wing of the bourgeoisie or another. You cannot have um, relatively impartial but still bourgeois judges and an efficient legal system for settling of accounts between capitalist companies without an indigenous bourgeoisie. If the indigenous bourgeoisie is absolutely tiny, utterly dependent, and effectively a managerial class carrying out the orders of foreign capitalism, then bourgeois democracy is objectively ruled out. And that's why you see in Africa either military rule, or even under so-called democratic civilian, civilian rule, such as the Bazoum government in Niger, which after his downfall, all the European press was saying, oh, he was a beacon of democracy and stability. His successor, and he jailed Protesters for, uh, they forbade protests under COVID rules. They um, arrested the opposition leader for baby smuggling. Now, if he is smuggling babies, that's appalling. I don't think he was smuggling babies. I think it's very coincidental that he was arrested for it before contesting an election. In other words, democracy in these countries is even more of a sham than bourgeois democracy everywhere else and essentially doesn't exist. What we're talking about at best is a regime of what Trotsky would describe as parliamentary bonapartism, where the, the, the kind of 
The machinery of parliament exists. You have elections, you have different par political parties, but everything is dependent on the executive. The party is dependent on the, the executive. The judiciary is dependent on the executive. And that is maintained by foreign imperialism. You have technical advisors that are effectively ministers in African governments appointed by France. So without any, um, with a capitalist class that's too weak and also a working class that in many of these countries is a tiny, tiny minority, an even smaller part, proportion of the population in some cases than, uh, than the Russian working class in 1917, where much of the countryside, to just give you a brief picture of the conditions that these countries are held in by imperialism. In Niger, 95% of the population works not only in agriculture, in subsistence agriculture. Uh, five million people are semi-nomadic pastoralists, like the Touareg people, who also uh, live in Mali. And um, so even the, the market and the, the bourgeois state barely reaches into these territories. The working class is either working in incredibly precarious conditions. Again, three quarters of the urban economy is what's called the informal economy. You know, people like tuk-tuk drivers, for instance, very precarious work. And then, of course, you've got the workers working in the mines and major industries owned by foreign imperialism. This is a very small working class, a very small capitalist class. Now, here I want to introduce a concept of Bonapartism. This is not a talk on Bonapartism, but we can't understand all the coups in the, in the Sahel without talking about Bonapartism. The military, the repressive arms of the state, actually raise itself above the rest of so-called civil society, again, above the contending classes in society, and essentially rule in its own name, acquire a certain um, autonomy and a certain independence, not an absolute independence. And what we see here is exactly that. We see an example of it or a form, a different form of it in absolutism, where the old nobility is, is weakened, but the rising bourgeoisie is too weak. We see it in periods of revolution and counter-revolution, where the bourgeois can, are too weakened to rule directly, but the working, working class is held back from taking power. We saw this in 1848. We saw this in the Weimar Republic. In, France, uh, in, in, in French Africa, it's not exactly the same pr process, but what we're talking about is a state in which the bourgeoisie cannot rule directly in a kind of liberal democratic fashion, but nor can the working class take power, partly because it's too small, but not, it's not absolutely ruled out that the working class could take power. It's also that there is currently no revolutionary party um, that, can, that can lead it to power. In those conditions, the rise of Bonapartist governments, either a parliamentary or a direct military fa um, fashion, I would say is almost inevitable. I think it may be a, bit, a step too far to say it's absolutely inevitable, but that's why there is such what they call a democratic deficit in these countries. But this so-called stability, a stability maintained by the oppressor to keep the, the enslaved and oppressed in their state of oppression, started to break down from the capital, global capitalist crisis of 2008. First of all, the financial crisis destabilized the capitalist class. Uh, the recession, of course, weakened the imperialist powers. But the, another impact that it had in Africa was in the course of 2006 to 2008, basic food staples doubled in price, many of them. At the same time, the ability of these states to obtain uh, finance was shaken at least, not destroyed, but shaken by the global financial crisis. This destabilization or this beginning of destabilization was first expressed through the Arab Spring that comrades will already be very familiar with, beginning in December 2010 in Tunisia, where a young man set himself alight because his last means of earning a livelihood, selling, I think it was fruit on a uh, stall by the side of the road, was removed. Following that, you have the revolution in Egypt in, uh, in 2011, and revolution spreading to Syria, Libya, uh, so on. The impact this haven't had on the imperialists is extremely important. It's worth remembering that Tunisia had been a key French ally right up until the revolution. The French had backed, uh, the, the Western imperialists had backed the Tunisian state, they backed the Mubarak regime in Egypt. All of a sudden, a process that they did not see, co see coming had toppled their allies. What are they to do? They're, they're at risk of losing influence in the region. They do a 180. So Nicolas Sarkozy, who up until that point, the French press had described him being on honeymoon with Gaddafi. Similar to Tony Blair in Britain did the same thing. Lots of pictures of them smiling and shaking hands on the red carpet uh, because they were giving Gaddafi money to prevent migrants from crossing uh, over the Mediterranean. All of a sudden, Nicolas Sarkozy comes out and makes a speech in which he says, we have only one goal to accompany, support, and help those people who have chosen liberty. So having maintained their dictators in power for decades, all of a sudden they were the main force for democratic change in the Middle East. What that meant was supporting the moderate Islamist rebels in Syria, and it meant uh, the imposition of a, a no-fly zone over, uh, over Libya. Um, at the same time as imp uh, um, um, imposing a ceasefire, and incidentally, in, in the current context, it shows you what imperialist ceasefires actually mean, there was an arms embargo on Libya 
But France, having armed the Gaddafi regime before the revolution, just started secretly channeling arms into the country in order to support the rebels, because what do the imperialists care about UN resolu resolutions? They write them. As a result, the Libyan state completely collapsed. After Gaddafi's killing, there was no nice democratic Libri Libya, there was no peace in Libya, there was outright barbarism, slave markets on the, on the coast, and an injection of both weapons and fighters across the Sahel, across the entire region, sorry, the Sahara, into the Sahel region. But one important point that I want to make is, it's not just that these arms and fighters came to Mali and started causing all this trouble. They arrived on fertile ground. And again, it's nothing to do with religion. It's not because the people of Mali or northern Mali were just waiting for some Islamic state to come and liberate them, and that they, they themselves are Islamists. What happened is desertification, climate change, was it is removing 500 football pitches a day of arable land. That meant that People who were already living on subsistence agriculture could no longer subsist. They were coming into violent conf conflict with neighboring nomadic pastoral groups. And when these fighters arrived, the actual state, the Malian state, couldn't even reach them, let alone settle the conflict. When these fighters arrived, many of these communities actually contracted with the Islamist groups in order to provide security effectively and intervene on their side. So these groups gained a foothold for no other reason than the, co the, the poverty and destitution of the, uh, the Malian countryside, which has been maintained by French imperialism for decades. Um, as a result of the expanding influence of these groups, Francois Hollande, the socialist president who was elected on a program of change, announced a military operation to basically save the Malian state called Operation Serval in 2013. In 2014, this expanded to the entire Sahel region and the G5 Sahel Alliance that I mentioned earlier at the start of this lead off called Operation Bakani. It's the largest French military operation since the Algerian war with a total of 5,000 um, French troops supplemented by, I think, a maximum of 15,000 UN peacekeepers from across Africa and, other, and Europe. Um, and interestingly, this might not come as a surprise, it certainly came as a surprise to French imperialism, since 2013, the extent of territory held by these Islamist groups actually expanded. The intervention of the French did not um, even halt the extension of the Islamist rebels. If anything, it actually encouraged it. Why is that? I'll come back to a point I made briefly earlier. It, it, the source of all this is poverty. The Economist magazine did an interview with someone who'd been a member of an Islamist group, and he said, they offer you a motorbike, food, a wife, everything, and a job, basically. This is a country in which you have mass unemployment, and the, the means of getting a living are even being destroyed by climate change and by the economic crisis. And so a lot of young men, this is also an extremely young population, but a lot of young men are turning to these groups because there is literally not, nothing else. I think there is a parallel to be drawn with gang violence in cities in, uh, in European, uh, in European um, countries as well. Added to that, the corruption of the state meant that many local, a report found that many local communities actually consider, when asked, they consider the Sharia law imposed by these groups to be a better legal system than what existed before. What an indictment of capitalism in these countries, that the bourgeois state is considered more corrupt and less efficient than Islamic state. It's not that these people have just died in the wall, these are reactionaries. Actually, most of the people interviewed don't say anything about religion whatsoever. They have to, everything is down to poverty and the collapse of the state. That meant that the French came in and um, had understood nothing about the country, carried out bombing raids. The De Spiegel um, paper or magazine in, uh, in Germany carried out an expose that in 2021, French planes bombed a village celebrating a wedding and killed hundreds of people. As a result, that increased anti-French sentiment in the countryside, which in turn pushed more communities to actually side with the rebels over an, a foreign army of occupation. And in the cities, the, the workers and impoverished masses of the cities turned more and more against the French as a result of the failure to deal with the problem and the ongoing, the, the French army became a representation basically of the entire crisis. You had protesters came, coming out saying, France dégage, France gets out, and saying that I, I hate this government because it supports France and France is the root cause of all of my problems. A, 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 a naively anti-imperialist message expressing that the cause of national liberation was intrinsically linked to the social question and the transformation of social conditions. Um, but in addition to this kind of essentially a, a collapse going on, you also have revolutionary developments taking place across the region. I already mentioned the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring found a powerful echo across Africa as well. In 2011, you had mass protests erupting in Senegal, which eventually um, led to the election out of power of Abdoulaye Wade um, and the coming to power of Macky Sall. Now, Wade would have happily just stayed in power. He was actually trying to introduce a constitutional change in order to make sure that he could stay in power. 
as a result of the mass protest and the general strike, he had to withdraw the, um, the reforms, so-called reforms, and actually contest the election fairly and stand down. So there's an interesting point here that de bourgeois democracy in elections only function even remotely well when the working class strikes and basically forces the rulers out of power. It shows the power of the working class here. Um, also in 2014, you had a revolutionary movement, um, protests of tens of thousands and a general strike in Burkina Faso against the regime of Blaise Compaoré. That's the person who assassinated Tom and San Thomas Sankara. Um, and you also had other movements, echoes of this in Togo, in, uh, in Gabon as well, that didn't actually result in the, the overthrow of the regime. But you can see that this is a much wider process because the conditions are all shared across the region. Even before the pandemic, you had mass protests breaking out in democratic Niger and again Gabon that were repressed by force. Uh, but now we come to um, a, a very important element in the equation. Another reason why what is happening is happening is that in addition to the destabilization of the old world, world order, the stability, the old ruling class not being able to rule in the same way, revolutionary developments and the accumulation of a revolutionary anti-establishment, sorry, anti-imperialist mood across the entire continent, not just West Africa. Also, the intervention of, shall we say, new imperialist powers. Previously, if an African country wanted to break away from, say, the CFA franc, its economy would be completely isolated. It would be destabilized. It couldn't get finance. It was on its own. It was on its own against the world. It could easily be brought to heel. If it tried to stand up for itself, its uh, leaders could be assassinated. But what, what has happened is with the rise of Russia and China in the region, that start, in the eyes of more nationalist leaders and African states, that started to pose a little bit of an alternative effectively. We would argue that it's not an alternative that is going to solve the problems. More, more imperialism is not going to solve the problems. But no longer are African states dependent solely on Western imperialism and Western finance, which is a major change in the situation, a tipping point, if you like. Speaking of Russian imperialism, Russia basically just read what France did and copied it. In, um, France, I mentioned that France intervened in a civil war in the Central African Republic. As a result of its hypo hypocrisy, basically, and weakness, it sent its troops in without camp beds, without mosquito spray, or even nets. So they didn't do very well, I'll put it that way. But also, scandals about rapes, massacres carried out by French forces and French allied forces meant that there was a scandal in France, which didn't marry very well with the hypocrisy of the French state about fighting for democracy. As a result, they pulled out with their tail between their legs in 2016. Apparently, the French suggested to the, uh, the um, Central African government that they should approach Russia to put forward a motion to allow arms to be imported into the country again because the government had run out of weapons. It needed more weapons and there was embargo. As a result, the Wagner company, the mercenary company, Russian mercenary company, became effectively the personal bodyguard of the, the president and carried on, basically carried on where the French left off. But without the hypocrisy and worries about internal stand scandals because of the, um, the, the, the Putin regime. As a result, it's not just that they've achieved goodwill. In return for their services, they have been signed the rights for uh, timber extraction, gold mining, diamond mining, all of which they channel back into Russia. They're an extension of Russian imperialism. Although I would point out that not a single thing, I'm no defender of Russian imperialism, but not a single thing that Russia has done, France hasn't done 10 times over. And Russia yet hasn't imposed a colonial country, uh, currency on the Central African Republic. But the main reason for that is they're not yet able. China is currently the main, the number one trade partner of the whole of the African continent. And they're actually starting to buy up uranium mining in places like um, Namibia. The, the state of Niger at one point actually tried to sell mining rights to China, but that was more of a negotiating tactic in order to get a better deal from the French. But I better move on. The, the key to this is that all of a sudden, because of the rivalry, because of the decline of Western imperialism, particularly French imperialism here, the decline of French imperialism, which is not just relative, but absolute, I would say, and the, um, the, the rise of new imperialist powers posing as a friend and an alternative, it means that these countries are, feel at least, or these governments, feel that they're able actually to pivot in their direction. And there, there they can find some development. Um, and this has all come to a head in what broke out in, in Mali, first and foremost. The system effectively broke down at its weakest link. This is a country in which they estimated that only 40% of the territory of the country was in the control of the government, we, we, you know, at the verge of state collapse. The, 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 the len, then leader in the summer of 2020, Ibrahim Keita, organized an election, oh, she was in the spring, sorry, organized an election for March and April in the middle of the first lockdown, of uh, the COVID-19 lockdown. Just to make sure he won, he arrested the leader of the opposition before the elections. The turnout to the election was 35%, but 
masses of people, thousands of people came out to the streets of Bamako, the capital in particular, protesting this coup effectively. As a result of this pressure, the constitutional court actually offered a concession. And this is a great example of how revolutions work. When that process is, is uplifted, neither concessions nor repression can stop it. Both actually uh, egg it on, drive it on. So when the constitutional court withdrew the, uh, it actually overturned the election results. Again, shows what working class, working class pressure is the only democratic force in the country. But when they granted that concession, the protest got larger because people thought this isn't just about election results, this is about my conditions. They realized we can actually win something here. It encouraged them. They came out, the state moved to repression, soldiers shot 14 protesters, but that repression made the protest even larger because people realized that we need to now fight to the finish. In that context, the army actually began to split along class lines. There was a mutiny at the military camp of Kati, which is just outside the, uh, the capital. Soldiers started firing into the air, literally drove to the palace and arrested the president immediately. The result was a transitional government, a power sharing agreement between civilian leaders and the military. Nine months later, the military leader of the first coup, As um, As Asimi Goita, <coughs> seized power in his own name and now rules a military Bonapartist state. Yes. But we shouldn't get pulled into these hypocritical phrases about democracy, dictatorship. We need to look under the surface. When we study the state and politics, we need to look at this class struggle underneath. This Bonaparte state, which is a Bonaparte state, came into power in, all, uh, in, the, in the midst of a revolution. A revolution was taking place. And as, as uh, Goita has taken power in order to stabilize the situation. Also, in the conditions existing in Mali, if the working class doesn't have a strong revolutionary party, and is incapable of taking power in its own name, in its own right, then a, a Bonaparte, some kind of Bonapartist formation, I would say, is inevitable. That's what the Goita regime represents. But it's not back to business as usual. Channeling the anti-French sentiment of that movement, first of all, they, I, I actually might get the order wrong, but they, they removed French as an official language, which, okay, is a relatively formal change. They pushed out the um, French military, basically cancelled Operation Bakani because they said that it wasn't helping. And they even pushed out the uh, French ambassador. In other words, it's, it knows, the government knows that it's leaning on a revolutionary mo movement, which could depose it, just as it deposed um, the, the original government. And they've turned to Russia. They've invited Wagner in to come and help them with the combat against uh, Islamist rebels. And they're trying to sign deals with Russian companies. The same process has taken place in Burkina Faso, but I would say it's gone even further. In Burkina Faso, you have protests that erupt on the 22nd of January, 2022. The day later, a, a, a section of the army officers led by a colonel. And this is, an, this is an interesting point that colonels are not the top of the army. Colonels are senior commissioned officers. The general staff, the generals and so on, they, uh, in, in these revolutions, uh, but these, these coups, sorry, they tend to be carried out by more junior officers like colonels. In the, in the case of one, even lesser, even lower, but I'll go on to that. Protests erupt. A, uh, a, a group of officers take power, form what they call a committee, a patriotic movement for the safeguard and restoration. They criticize the, the government's failure to defeat the rebels, but they don't kick the French out. There's, a, there's actually a debate within the regime about whether they should actually turn to Russia or not. Demiba, the leader at that point, decided not. The, uh, the, the situation continues to deteriorate. Local communities actually start arming themselves and forming defense committees which the army actually tries to repress. A, a scandal erupts when um, 11 Burkinabi soldiers and 50 ci uh, civilians are killed or kidnapped by Islamist forces in the north. And a group of even more junior officers led by Captain Ibrahim Traore, who, who was based in the north, end up seizing power from the... So we have a coup overturning another coup. What is driving all this? What's driving this, of course, is the, the crisis and collapse going on in Burkina Faso. But there's also a deep, there's a revolutionary part, process going on. These people are not necessarily conscious revolutionaries who see themselves as, as overthrowing capitalism. They haven't overthrown capitalism. But they are resting on a mood of anti-French imperialism and a, a, a recognition that they need, to, a nationalist mood, if you like, that they need to control, take control of their own destiny. And the Demiba regime was overthrown precisely because it didn't satisfy that need. Now Traore is coming out the French military has been pushed out of Burkina Faso. French ambassador has been kicked out. And, uh, and um, uh, Traore is deliberately, maybe honestly, I don't know. I don't know the guy. But he is leaning on the tradition of Thomas Sankara. He's wearing a red beret. He's cut the wages of uh, civil servants, state officials. And he gave a speech which is worth quoting. 
Now, Putin, in order to qu uh, court the support of African nations, he held a summit in which he talked about the anti-colonial struggle. He talked about Western colonialism. He linked the war in Ukraine to the, the liberation struggle of African nations. He's trying to pose, basic, by the way, like all new rival imperialist powers, he's trying to pose as a friend who's going to give him a better deal. You might not remember this, but the United States actually did the same thing in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. Japanese imperialism, the Japanese empire talked about Asia for the Asiatics, all well and good. They didn't specify that the only Asiatics in charge of Asia would be the Japanese. The, the, Russia, the uh, Russian imperialism is using the same language. But what I find particularly striking is in his speech, Captain um, Ibrahim Trahore says, my generation also asked me to say that because of this poverty, they are forced to cross the ocean to try and reach Europe. They die in the ocean, but soon they will no longer have to cross because they will come to our palaces and seek their daily bread. We African heads of state must stop behaving like puppets who dance every time the imperialists pull the strings. Glory to our peoples, dignity to our peoples, victory to our peoples, homeland or death, we shall conquer. Now, whether he himself is a conscious revolutionary or not, he is clearly, I think it's quite clear that he is explicitly resting on the tradition of Sankara, the tradition of Che Guevara, and the liberation struggles of the post-war period. A nationalist, anti-imperialist mood. Why? Because he knows that he has the popular base. Both the regime in Bur uh, Burkina Faso and the regime in, uh, in Mali have been met with popular protests of support. So not protests, demonstrations of support, waving Russian flags and um, burning French flags. This, these regimes, whether they necessarily mean to or not, are expressing a revolutionary process that's been going on, frankly, since the Arab Spring. Under The mole of revolution has been boiling away under the surface and is starting to come out. But this has accelerated things. There's a domino effect coming in. Because in Niger, for instance, it was a slightly different situation. A power struggle emerges at the top. Bazoum was going to sack the head of his presidential guard. The head of his presidential guard, who is a general, turns around and arrests him in his home and announces, I'm the government. At the same time, you have... Popular demonstrations of support, again, waving Russian flags. Whether that was at all what Chayini um, intended or not, I have no idea. But he has run with it. And so now the French military has been pushed out of Niger. And the demonstrators surrounded the French embassy. When the French ambassador refused to leave, and, and protesters surrounded the embassy and blockaded it, prevented food or water from getting in until they, they left. I would say that this movement is far out of control of anyone. It's not under the control of the French imperialists, certainly not under the control of Russia or China, and it's not even in control of their own states. We have to see where this goes. Gabon is a similar situation. I haven't seen any anti-French policies coming out of Gabon, but I am convinced that the reason that the presidential guard moved against Ali Bongo was because they were worried that if they didn't, an even bigger revolutionary movement would come and slip out of their hands. This is what we're talking about. What we're talking about is not simply, oh dear, the end of democracy in Africa, what's going to happen next? We're talking about a revolutionary process, an extremely complicated revolutionary process that we have to watch extremely closely. Finally, I want to talk about what's going to happen very briefly, and I apologize for going over time. It's difficult to deal with an entire region um, satisfactorily. Um, what is going to happen? Um, in, following the Niger coup, ECOWAS, which is the regional body for West Africa, led by Nigeria, um, announced that it was going to intervene. It imposed sanctions. It blockaded Niger. It also said that it launched a military operation. Now, maybe one of you can come in and tell me where that military operation is. I can see no evidence that it's taken place whatsoever. There's a very good reason for that. Part of it is actually the Nigerian state has been so weakened that it, I don't think the Nigerian army could even reach Niger. One, um, one bourgeois politician the former director of the Central Bank of Nigeria, said, if we declare war on Niger, we're declaring war on northern Nigeria because of the Hausa question. He also said, and I can't believe a bourgeois politician would admit this, our army is not equipped to fight a war in Niger. Niger is the poorest country on earth, according to the UN. And the Niger Nigeria considers itself a regional imperialist power, the natural leader of West Africa, and they are incapable of fighting a war in their closest neighbor. That shows the instability and the weakness of even the most powerful capitalist country in West Africa. But it's not just that, there's a social question here. You've had the NSARS movement, which was a huge insurrectionary movement in Nigeria in 2020. You had mass protests at a time when the government is carrying out cuts and aust austerity. They know they launch a war against their closest neighbor, against an anti-imperialist or and a regime styling itself as anti-imperialist. They could easily provoke a revolution movement inside Nigeria. And a revolution in Nigeria completely blows the situation open. It will completely transform the situation because of the size and strength of the Nigerian working class. Senegal also, they've had their own mass demonstrations because of the arrest of opposition leaders and the same kind of you know, constitutional jiggery-pokery that I've already explained. So I won't, I won't take up time going into that situation. All of the capitalist regimes in West Africa are terrified that they're next. And this, that's, that's the 
the worried side of it for the ruling class. But on the other hand, um, left-wing political parties, activists across the entire African continent are looking at this and also asking, what's next? Julius Malema, who is uh, the leader of the economic fight, freedom fighters, basically a left-wing split from the ANC, so a, a sort of a nationalist, an African nationalist organization, but left-wing, issued a tweet in French saying, don't disappoint us, Cameroon, we're watching. <laughs> Now, Julius Malema does not speak French. He's had that translated in order to say to the, the masses of Cameroon, do it, go on, let's continue this process. So what's going to happen next? France still has, its, its economic interests are still intact in West Africa. Niger hasn't kicked out Orano or anything like that. But politically, it is finished. The whole of La France Afrique is based on the idea that the dictators or the rulers of these countries know if they get into trouble, France will come in and help them. Well. These regimes have, been, regimes have been overturned. France has been able to do absolutely nothing. So the whole game just collapses as a result of that. So does that mean that Russia is going to become the dominant power? Now, the, this is a key question that I can't go into. Is Russia capable of stabilizing this situation? My own opinion is it is, is absolutely not capable of stabilizing this situation. The Wagner company is not strong enough to stabilize the whole of the Sahel. It's also been weakened by the, the murder or the accidental death, whichever you prefer, of its, of its, its head. Um, at the same time, Russia is still fighting the Ukraine war, and it doesn't have, it's not as powerful a capitalist economic weight as the likes of China, or even France for that matter. China has the economic power, but does it have an interest at this stage in getting bogged down into a war in the Sahel? And also, does it have the military power? No. The point is that Western imperialism is actually still dominant in West, in West Africa, but it's on the decline, it's on the retreat, it does not know what to do. The rising powers also don't know what to do and cannot implant their order on the situation. What that multipolarity means is not progress and development for Africa, I'm sorry to say. It means more disorder, more crisis, state collapse, barbarism, and revolution. And that's the perspective that we are looking at and working towards. What is the nature of this revolution going to be? I'd, I'd hope the one thing that's come apparent from my introduction is that not a single one of the, the tasks of the democratic, even the bourgeois revolution, have been carried out in West Africa. National unification, not carried out. The overthrow of these arbitrary imperialist borders, not carried out. Even the formation, even, even capitalist development in many parts of the countryside hasn't been ca carried out. Electoral democracy hasn't been carried out. Establishment of the ruling law, rule of law hasn't been carried out. But the question I ask you is, what force in Africa is capable of carrying out any of these tasks? Can the African bourgeoisie, which barely exists, and where it exists is just a managerial class under foreign imperialism, can they carry out the, these democratic tasks of the revolution? I, I would say our perspective must rest on the answer, no, it absolutely cannot. Who can then? The peasantry, which form the majority of the, uh, the population in these countries, they will be a huge engine room. They will be the masses required that, that can carry out this revolution. But at no time in history has any peasantry been able to independently overthrow capitalism. The only class capable of leading this movement is the African working class. The African masses as a whole, in which I include the peasantry and the, the, the poor people sitting in the, uh, living in the cities, but led by the working class. That is the key to the African revolution, a revolution which we are basically on the threshold of. Perhaps we'll look back and say it had already begun. I don't want to commit myself at this stage. That's why I'm saying watch it so closely. What we're looking at is a revolution, the task of which is to sweep away, not just to, to kick out the imperialists, but to sweep away all of the rotten, petty states of Africa, all of the artificial borders, and actually begin to develop the economy in a planned, rational, democratic way, led by the working class. And finally, what that means is we have to build the IMT and build the forces of revolution in this country, in France, in the United States, in Russia, in China, in the imperialist countries, because you cannot have African liberation without the overthrow of imperialism everywhere. So for that reason, I will conclude, build the IMT. Thank you.